Thank you, Suzanne. I'm going to try and be really close to this so we don't get feedback. Um, and I'm providing a little background on the project, hoping to whet your appetites for the panel. There's a lot of information. I will try and um, essentially not overwhelm, but we're looking forward to your questions. And first, I'd like to start with a huge thank you to the project sponsors, um, Alberta Innovates, Nutrien, Cavendish Farms, Alberta Irrigation Districts Association, the SMRID, and Prairie's Economic Development Canada. The type of collaborative project that this is, is not possible without the sort of foresight and forward thinking, creative thinking and willingness to support this kind of thing by multiple diverse uh, members of government and industry and that kind of thing. Similarly, we needed involvement of many, many diverse participants to bring their perspectives, and their understanding, and their expertise. We have had many diverse organizations represented with our working groups and throughout the project and interviews. This is just some of the member organizations that were represented, and we're very grateful to everyone that participated for their expertise that contributed to the overall uh, big picture that was this project. So this is the Agriculture's Water Future Project. It was about exploring water stewardship in an ag agriculture supply chain in southern Alberta. And so then the question is, what is water stewardship? So for this project, water stewardship is the use and safeguarding of fresh water that is socially equitable, environmentally sustainable, and economically beneficial. It's um, about using water responsibly, in essence, recognizing that the local water resources are shared, and also managing the site's water-related risks. So that includes water security, regulatory fines, um, any manner of risks. The five objectives for water stewardship can generally be um, categorized as water use or efficiency. That's easy, and we've talked a lot about that this, this couple days. Uh, water quality, sensitive areas such as wetlands, uh, safe water sanitation and hygiene, and water governance. So a very holistic approach. And this, uh, this all comes from the Alliance for Water Stewardship, which is a global membership organization. You can see the little icon on the side here is the Alliance for Water Stewardship standard process. There are five steps in that process for following water stewardship and um, planning, water stewardship planning and implementation. We'll go into that a little bit more later. But essentially, this standard is a universal framework and process for sustainable water use, and that was our guide throughout this project. Why pursue water stewardship versus water management? I guess this also gets at a little bit of the difference when we're thinking about water stewardship. Uh, we talked about sort of that holistic approach, and it also extends beyond the boundaries of your operation though that is where it differs largely from water management. In the graphic here, you can see water management. We have a little tiny fence or operational boundary in the middle circle. Um, and beyond that outside, there is the dotted blue line, which is the watershed boundary. In a sense, the water stewardship approaches go beyond that internal operational boundary into the broader watershed and extend, in some cases, right to the watershed boundary. That's in terms of the thinking and the approach conversations with other water users, so it reaches beyond one's operation. And that actually gets at where some of the benefits can be. So water stewardship includes potential benefits to the operation and the watershed um, that are broader and more diverse than water management. There are more opportunities, broader potential benefits that are to your operation, but also beyond. It also enables managing risks. So of course, an operation has impacts beyond its boundaries and risks, especially water-related risks, that are outside of its control. Water stewardship is designed to identify and manage risks, including the ones that are outside of one's control, and the risks can be operational, regulatory, reputational, or financial. So in this project, we were very fortunate to have key participant operations, um, piloting entities, really three levels of the potato supply chain were involved. Um, a water supplier, 
So um, SMRID in this case, the largest irrigation district in Alberta. We also engaged and had involvement in lots of input from a potato producer. And, and then the last point was the potato processor. So John McQuarrie here representing Cavendish Farms was heavily involved. Unfortunately, the timing of this conference um, meant that none of the potato producers who we spoke to, and in particular the key potato producer who was involved, were able to come to this panel. Um, so unfortunately we haven't got that representation, but I will do my best with a couple of slides to represent what we heard during the project from the producers who were involved. So that went one too far, I think. Oh no, that's fine. The Agriculture's Water Future project, in essence, had two linked processes. We can think of it like the working group involvement and this bigger picture thinking around what is water stewardship for agriculture, what does that look like, how is it, in, how is it going to be implemented, or what does on-the-ground process look like in Alberta and for the whole industry. And then the pilot project, which is where SMRID and Cavendish Farms were very heavily involved, and you can see on the map here a little delineation of the localized area that we were specifically looking at for their operations and what does water stewardship look like for them. The water stewardship process, I touched on this before with the Alliance for Water Stewardship standard, that was our guide. Here we see step one, step two, step three, step four, and step five are in colored boxes. For this project, we did uh, six or seven essentially of these boxes. We did gathering and understanding the water data and information about the whole watershed and each operation. We assessed risks and challenges and opportunities with the individual operators and with the big working group to gather as much input and perspectives as possible. We identified and engaged stakeholders and stakeholder engagement is a very key aspect of water stewardship and differs from water management. In this case, we were particularly wanting to hear from stakeholders of what are their water risks in order to understand the bigger picture of water risks for an area, what are the key concerns, and maybe those can be managed collaboratively. Committing and planning work we also did together, especially working with Cavendish Farms and SMRID. We developed key values and the purpose or intention with their water stewardship for each operation. We set objectives and some uh, tentative starting points in terms of targets and um, metrics for those, and then we formalized an initial pro, uh, commitment towards water stewardship, all captured in the big blue box in the middle, the water stewardship plan. So we did develop a water stewardship plan document for each operation, and that intended and distilled all of our learnings, all the data and the information from their whole process into one document that would be a guiding a guiding document and capture all the information for the operators. So this is intended to be that tool moving forward to enable implementing the actions, deciding on where to go next, um, reviewing that water stewardship plan based on your results of implemented actions, and moving forward from there. Within this project, like I said, we did step one, step two, got to the water stewardship plan and started on some of those implementation actions in step three. We have a lot of learnings from this project, um, lots and lots of great input, and I will leave most of the key learnings to John and David so that you will be excited to hear the panel discussion. Um, but there's a couple of things I'm definitely needing to mention to start with. Some of what we explored in depth was the business case for water stewardship. Why would one do water stewardship? And we tried to get at this in a couple of different ways. Some of those key learnings were um, that business, the business case is going to be company specific. The costs or benefit analysis would be very specific for a water stewardship action. Those would be determined by different factors for an operation. As well, preemptive action. We talked a lot about getting ahead of um, upcoming or increasing requirements or demands or re reporting expectations from a, from a buyer. That kind of thing is preemptive action. It's a bit hard to quantify. Similarly, cost avoidance. If we're talking about risks and managing 
getting ahead of some forms of risks, if you avoid that cost from the risk, then it's, again, a little bit harder to quantify that, less tangible. And then value is not directly related to dollars. A lot of what we talked about had, had a lot of value, or, and we talked about great opportunities, big value to individual operations or to the industry, um, and those were not gonna be easily quantified either. So intangible benefits, as well as the tangible ones that might be able to quantify for a specific stewardship action. I have a couple of slides here where I'm trying to distill the learnings that we have captured and what we heard from producers during the project. A key theme from producers that we heard was a general sort of lack of recognition of what stewardship is and, and sustainability and what best management practices are already being done. If, if there's lots that's already being done, we've heard a lot about that this, this, these last couple days, and those are not being recognized or acknowledged or um, uh, credited in some way, that's certainly not very encouraging for anyone to do more. Um, so this, of course, includes things like public or government celebrating the industry. Um, that also goes to the recognition, retailers, marketing, or cost recovery and compensation for activities that have already been done. One category of uh, feedback that we heard was to do with the current requirements. Documentation and meeting sustainability related reporting requirements is already onerous. Potatoes are the most demanding crop, my understanding, here in Alberta in terms of documentation. And we also heard not interested in doing more audits. The overall language and messaging in the industry, we heard a few different things around this, um, depending on the, the messaging or where that's coming from, lack of understanding of actual agriculture on the ground and practices today. And then we may have heard a little bit about this as well, terms such as sustainable or regenerative farming, sometimes being tossed around in terms of buzzwords, not really recognizing the economic sustainability of an operation and that it's a business. There's frustration in terms of messaging or optics from some uh, companies, the rollout of messaging around what is sustainable or regenerative agriculture, what that means, and implying that the farmers don't know what they're doing, the company's helping them. That was a message we heard from some producers. Um, and then we also heard a hypothesis that maybe consumers uh, want quality and affordable food. Um, and that the shareholders and investors or perhaps some other entity that's not exactly the consumers, they're driving that sustainability reporting for market competition or for some other reason. So there's a, we often say, well, the consumer wants, but we heard maybe a little pushback on that from some of the producers saying it might actually be that the consumer is being told to want such and such. In terms of the feedback from producers on government direction, there was some frustration expressed about the lack of recognition of what's already been done, um, or a lack of understanding of the industry and the context for the GHG emissions reduction plan. Um, another comment around what is the baseline for your benchmark? It has to be appropriate. For example, 50% of improvement from what point and what technology or what point in time. Um, year over year comparison is a problem. Producers mentioned that in an industry where not everything is under one's control, um, including international markets, but especially weather and input costs, those things mean, and they change from year to year, it would mean that year over year comparison, um, for some metrics especially, will really not tell you anything and is not, a, not relevant. A context and industry-wide measurements. This is getting at not wanting to pit one region against another and ensuring that the context for what is sustainability in that region is being included and captured. This is a, a big piece of where we were going with the interest in water stewardship to start with. So it is reiterating from the producer's perspective that it's very important to have that context. And the last thing here was related to data. We did hear concerns around taking more or using data, um, how the data and information that a farmer is providing would be used, um, and that enough of in information and data is already provided through various other reporting that's already onerous. So that information should be sufficient for the sustainability reporting that's being requested, especially where it feels like the same questions are being asked in multiple different ways. So for water stewardship, there was a couple of key challenges. 
capacity requirements for water stewardship are a big um, key challenge we ran into and encountered. So for producers especially, a significant capacity is required for doing this work for any entity that's pursuing water stewardship, as you can imagine, going beyond the boundary of the, the farm. In this case, that capacity requirement is a barrier. And water stewardship requires stakeholder engagement. I talked about that a little bit. So that's, that's involving a bunch of capacity and time and connection that, um, again, is a bit of a barrier and was a key barrier for producers involved in this project. Distilling the challenge of documentation that we heard, because water stewardship involves a lot of documentation when, and we were following the Alliance for Water Stewardship Standard as a guide. Continuous improvement is part of that, um, the design and of that process. That requires documentation for yourself and for external. The amount of document documentation was a barrier. What we heard from producers was that they have said doing water stewardship, the actual activities or water management on the property, very, totally reasonable, often is already being done in many forms but the annual documentation would be the significant burden and it affects business viability. Leading to the overarching challenge of kind of pointing at this bigger thing, sustainability, or sourcing documentation. Uh, we've heard a little bit about that this, um, these last couple of days. Many different supply chains for agriculture products are starting to look for some form of credible, measurable, verifiable demonstration of sustainability. They want to be able to demonstrate their sustainable sourcing, perhaps as a buyer or to the, if they're a consumer facing entity, they're demonstrating that through their supply chain. In many cases, the buyer, that entity may not have yet defined their sustainable sourcing practices and focus. So kind of what they mean by sustainability um, and what they need for demonstrating it. And if they haven't defined that yet, that's uh, leading to a lot of different questions or different sort of avenues of getting at sustainability. This is a, a global challenge because of international markets and supply chain pressures compound on the producer. And of course, it's not just about water. We're now talking much bigger than water that gets at land use and air, energy use, business profitability or the sustainability of your operation and then community resilience, as well as, of course, within here, there's the carbon question and carbon capture. And through the project, this, this sort of distills into a pressure through the supply chain, demonstrated here as starting with the environmental resource constraints and climate change, leading to uh, consumers or stakeholders, investors, wanting more sustainable products or demonstration of that, proof of that, retailers feeling those pressures, asking the processors, processors feeling the pressure, asking producers. Um, and of course, that's the producer at the bottom with the least capacity for um, some of this demonstration, which similarly is compounded again, because a producer might be um, with the rotational crops, may be required from multiple different supply chains um, or asked from multiple different supply chains for different sustainable practices, different reporting, that all uh, adds, adds up to an unreasonable and unmanageable sort of burden um, for a producer. So because producers are at the foundation of the agri-food supply chain, if the pressures they're currently facing are addressed, they could be actively support sustainable reporting for requirements for the whole supply chain. They're in a, the key position, but those challenges and pressures need to be addressed. We have identified cost recovery as one of the key opportunities. There's an interest in some established precedent for cost recovery or compensation, which would be going through the supply chain for verified sustainable practices. So for example, with uh, uh, verified sustainable beef in the beef industry. And combined reporting requirements would be another sort of obvious thing. We just looked at the graphic where the three supply chains might be requiring different things. So sustainable or combining the reporting requirements, different crop groups or agriculture commodity groups would be working ideally to make the exact same annual reporting requirements so that all levels in the supply chain can have those answers for the sustainability um, reporting or the sustainable sourcing data, but it's not an additional burden for the producer. So that leads me to the last couple things here. 
our project ran through all of that process and landed on recognizing, well, what could that potential one tool combined reporting be? And we had the, um, the ARECA, Alberta Resource, Agriculture Resource and Extension Council of Alberta engaged in the project from the beginning as part of the working group. And fortunately, Tanya was able to join and provide a lot more detailed information about the environmental farm plan later in the project when it really landed that this was going to be an, a key part of our solution and findings and possible next steps. So we're exploring the EFP as a potential tool to address this bigger picture challenge. Um, there's a couple things about the EFP, and Tanya will be able to go into a lot more, but it's especially designed for a farm operator to understand or recognize their risks and create a plan. There is no disclosure, um, and there's no evaluation or grading. That works well for aspects of the water stewardship that we were focused on, and doesn't, and aligns as well with some of the things we heard from producers. The EFP Plus, which you'll hear more about, is benchmarked to an international sustainability standard, the FSA, which is verified through an audit process if the FSA is pursued. So that is an opportunity for the verified side of um, the reporting. And then project working, the project is working to highlight water stewardship that is in the EFP already. We have a few questions identified, but um, there is already a lot of questions within the EFP and within the chapters. There are 20 chapters and more than 40 questions that already relate to water management. Um, and that's just the current, I think this is actually even the previous version of the EFP, which I was looking at when I went through online. Um, so that aligns very well with water stewardship already. So overall, conclusions from our project work were that water stewardship is one part of a bigger focus on resource, responsible resource use. All points in the supply chain, so processors, producers, suppliers, et cetera, they're hearing these kinds of questions about credible and measurable representation or demonstration of sustainable sourcing, and the cost recovery and combining reporting requirements are two core solution opportunities that would sort of overcome barriers that producers are currently facing. And the opportunity for collaboration between all points in the agri-food and supply chain is really key. Some of this is already being leveraged by, um, by groups in the sector that have been working with us and we've been connecting and understanding what their work is doing. You'll hear more about that, I think, from John. And essentially, water stewardship planning was valuable for John and David. They'll be able to talk to more detail on that. And water stewardship aligns well with the EFP and current sustainability initiatives by other organizations. Oh yes, the last thing is one page summaries of this project are available. I'm at the table here, you can just ask me. And we have water stewardship plan documents for Cavendish and SMRID um, posted on the WaterSmart website. That's great, thank you, Brie. <clears throat> I'm going to now lead a discussion by posing some questions to the panel that have been prepared beforehand. And um, we will make room for your questions towards the end of our time slot. So I would like to begin by asking David, what motivated your organization to consider participation in the pilot project? Is this on? Oh, it is. Okay. Um, there was a lot of factors that we took into consideration of why we wanted to participate, and the timing was actually um, very coincidental, but very critical to right at the time that we secured and announced the Alberta Irrigation Modernization Program was when we were approached if we wanted to participate in this pilot project. So I would say the top three for the SMRID of why I wanted to really participate and I thought there was value was first of all I just wanted to see as an organization where the SMRED um, where, where we were already at from a water stewardship level as compared to this international standard that I did wasn't aware of until I was approached to do this pilot. I didn't realize about the AWS and I was very curious just to see from a benchmarking perspective where we halfway there, where we kind of there, where we had miles to go, so I was, quite, I was quite interested to see that. The second one 
was um, I thought it was very important for us as a supplier to just participate in this kind of initiative. I think um, it's res it's kind of our responsibility to help help promote and and further the efforts of just agriculture in Canada, but for particularly southern Alberta, and and it just lended that it was the right thing for us to want to participate in something like that. One of our core values at the SMRID is do the right thing, and I thought this was doing the right thing, was to participate. And then finally, and this is kind of coming back to that timing of the, uh, of the uh, announcement of AIM, was as soon as the AIM program was announced, there was um, some um, expressed concerns by certain organizations that maybe irrigation expansion in Alberta was not the best thing for water resources. And I thought that was a very valid concern, and I thought, but I thought this was a way for the irrigation districts who were, you know, and obviously we were one of them, participating in that program to show that we take water stewardship very seriously. It's, it's an important to all of our mandates of what we're trying to do, and so I thought this was a way to kind of formalize a way of reviewing it and then being able to demonstrate what, what districts are doing, so. That's great, thank you. John, I'd like to ask you the same question. Uh, why did Cavendish Farms want to get involved in this project? Yes, and thank you, and I'm really glad to be here today. And, and for me to answer that question, first of all, I need to tell you a little bit about our organization. So Cavendish Farms is part of the Irving Group of Companies, headquartered in New Brunswick. And we have sister companies in the shipbuilding business, in the forestry, from, from producing trees you know, to producing lumber, to producing pulp paper, value-added tissue, to transportation. Um, we're a very integrated company. And, and throughout all of the Irving companies, one of the things that are, is common to all of us are a set of company values. And, uh, you know, I've worked in a number of different places where we, we develop values and they become a poster on the wall and kind of interesting. But I can tell you that in the Irving group, uh, we're, we're privately held, it would be rare to have a conversation with the owner when they don't raise the values and talk about them and talk about how important they are and, and how they feel the values drive our culture and help us to make decisions. So one of the, the Irving values is that we operate at, at the highest standards in terms of taking care of the environment. So to, to a certain extent, this is really for us sort of following our values and, and being real, now, particularly because our facility here in Lethbridge is, is relatively new. It opened in August of, of 2019. So number one is its values. Second thing that um, is becoming more and more important, and, and we've talked about it, several people have alluded today to sustainability and, and what consumers want and what customers want. And for Cavendish Farms, you know, I'm, in, uh, I'm responsible for telling our story and, and, uh, you know, to, to, to our customers because they want to know more and more and more. And, and if I go back a couple of years ago, you know, the big customers would sort of ask general questions about well, what are we doing and how are we engaging in suppliers. Today, uh, the customers are getting very detailed in terms of wanting to know how we're managing our operations and they're really, the top two issues on their mind are number one, are what are you doing with water and what are you doing about greenhouse gas? So it's, it's, not, it's not just good enough you know, for us to, to think about water management in the confines of our operation. We really need to think about sort of how are we operating in the context of, of, of a particular area. Now interesting, you know, the, the home plant for our company is in Prince Edward Island, and that, that's where I'm based. And uh, we don't have a written water stewardship plan, but we do have water stewardship process. And so every year, we meet with the community, with the watershed groups and the growers and the local community. We get together and with government, and, and we, we tell people what we're doing because we, we extract our own water, we treat our own water, and so we're, we're pretty transparent. So. I feel fortunate that I was approached you know, to, you know, to participate in this process because for us, it was an opportunity to, to engage with the local community and to really get to understand you know, what, what the local context is in a, in a dry part of the world. So I think about values, uh, but also thinking about it, it's self-serving, but we need to have a good story for our customers when they're asking us what are we doing around our operations and sustainable sourcing. So to be associated with this kind of a process, in particular to be associated with a process that could lead to certification of, of AWS, which, which has meaning and credibility, it's important for us. Very good, thank you. John, um, can you just provide an example of short or long-term action that was developed by your organization through this water stewardship planning process? 
How was it identified? How were your partnerships formed? It was really interesting because typically when I started this process, if you asked me to, I, you know, to, uh, to define water stewardship, I, I don't think I could have done it or I would have talked about managing water in the confines of our organization. So I've learned a lot about, uh, about uh, you know, the context that we work in. So uh, short term, it has helped us to think about some of the risks. I mean, we in Lethbridge, we buy our water from the town. And so we, we normally don't think about the risk of supply because we've got a supplier and that, that's their business, right? But part of this process forced us to think about, well, what are the risks if, if the supply was challenged? And, and that hadn't been something we thought of before. The other thing that I, I think, uh, and it's, it's longer term, but uh, we are looking at AWS certification. And this process was, it was really foundational for us to even think about doing that. Um, didn't know much about AWS, certainly didn't know what that journey looked like, but I do now. Uh, so longer term, we are giving serious consideration to looking at AWS certification. But I also think that uh, another a very important thing that that's sort of short term and long term is, you know, we've developed some relationships throughout this process that I want to see carry on. So I, th I think this was not just uh, to get together for this project. I think about, you know, working with the, with, uh, the watershed group and, and with the irrigation district. Obviously, we've got a lot in common and sort of carrying on that relationship is, is going to be really important to us. So. That sounds great. And communication is the key. Oh, communication is critical, and, and back to uh, we, need to, we need to talk more about this because our, our customers want to see that we're doing that. So it's, it's, a, it's a healthy driver. That's great. David, I'll go back to you. A number of tools and example documents were developed through the course of this project to help implementers understand and start water, water stewardship planning. Do you feel that these materials will help an implementer like yourself if you had to start over? Absolutely. Uh, obviously, if any of the other IDs or any kind of entity that wants to look at looking at what they want to look at, where they're at, benchmarking for water stewardship, or seriously thinking about wanting to go for the certification, I think because we did this pilot project, I know for ourselves that I can go back now for my organization, a big takeaway was we developed a risk matrix and then basically an initiative to, to have an action plan. So now we've identified short, medium, and long-term things that we would think we could like to implement. We may not be able to get to all of them, but I really like the fact because those will line up very well and I can use those to as a basis to look at my overall strategic planning for the organization because I think a lot of them will fit to a lot of the things we wanted to do. But now this process helped us articulate them very concretely and now we can specifically say, okay, based on how we've ranked short, medium, and long term, now let's figure out what resources, how we want to do it, which ones in which order, all those kind of things. So I found that very helpful for us. What kind of risks did you identify? Oh, there's a lot. <laughs> I would say a lot of it was, um, I would say, external for us. Um, one of the ones that um, was, and I, if you go to the website, you can see our sample plan. I've got some of the short and long-term things that we're going to work on, but one of the ones that jumped out to mind, and also we heard all about it yesterday, is the review of the IJC order. We get a significant amount of our water supply through that order, comes up the St. Mary River. If, if that order were to change, which it sounds like yesterday it may have administrative changes, but they're not looking at actual quantity change, which is obviously a big relief for the SMRID, but I was very interested, but that was a risk we identified. If that something were to change in that, we would have to obviously look at our source and how we operated and all those kind of things. But that was an example of one risk that was identified. Another potential long-term consideration. Yes. Right. Uh, John, from your perspective, Will implementers require additional human resource capacity to support water stewardship planning, both in implementing and future planning processes? I think the answer to that question uh, somewhat depends on the size of the organization. So, I mean, we're, we're a large organization. I mean, we've, we've got the luxury of, of dedicating a position, my position, to this kind of work. So, in, in a sense, I'm an additional resource, but that's just because we have to respond to a changing world where people want to know more about sustainability. Unquestionably, we learned throughout this process that, that for an organization like a farm, it just was, was really more than, than what they can do. It wasn't that the farm wasn't interested, it just came down to a practical issue about having the resources you know, to do this. Um, so in a sense, it means additional resource time, but 
in our world, we don't have the luxury of thinking about that because we have to do this kind of stuff. So we really need to make sure that we're operating um, sustainably and it's not just being making sure that we're doing it. We have to be able to tell that story. And that just means that we've got to allocate some resources because that's, that's the changing world. I, I think that one of the great debates that we have around this whole sustainability thing and, and sort of we're, we're piling more on, on processors and we're piling more on farmers and, and uh, I'm, I'm really lucky you know, to work with the sustainability organization that brings in all of our competitors to talk about measuring sustainability at the farm level and some of my current and some of my past colleagues are in this room. But we've often had discussions about, well, who's going to pay for all this? Because it does mean extra work. And we don't have the answer to that question yet, but it's something that, that's certainly in the back of our mind. But yeah, it's, it's, it's extra work, but it's, uh, it's, it's, we have to do it, but it's also the right thing to do. So. Great. Thank you. Tanya, the next question's for you. Can you provide a brief overview of the Alberta Environmental Farm Plan and the Environmental Farm Plan Plus? and how they might be well positioned in recognizing the challenges identified by producers to meet buyers' needs for reporting. Thanks for that question. Um, the Environmental Farm Plan is a voluntary whole farm self-assessment tool that helps producers uh, identify the risks on their farms and then develop, develop plans to mitigate those risks. Um, the, the, pro the plan was actually originally developed by farmers for farmers in Alberta uh, under Erica. Um, they, there is a farmer-led producer board, and there are uh, a st there's a stakeholder committee uh, that guides the EFP as well. So we're we're quite connected on the ground to the producers. Um, the EFP Plus is an EFP uh, workbook that's been benchmarked to an international standard, the, um, the Farm Sustainability Assessment out of the Sustainable Agricultural Initiative. And by completing that EFP workbook, uh, which is the EFP plus uh, just a few more questions, uh, the producer automatically receives cr credit for completing that FSA questionnaire. And those questions are mapped in the background, so they get an EFP as well as the uh, credit for completing the FSA questionnaire. Um, the actual information is kept confidential, and producers can choose what they do with it. Um, there is a report, um, and again, the producer is, is the, the director on that information, and um, the EFP certificate can provide them with other options as well. And the, the EFP uh, is a key delivery mechanism to achieve environmental outcomes uh, for sustainable sourcing and a proactive way for producers to demonstrate their environmental uh, stewardship as well as document it. And if we think about the AWS that's been talked about, um, that could be very similar to the uh, international standard in which case we would be mapping uh, those AWS criteria in the background with the EFP. So, And are the reports that you're speaking of the same kind of reporting that Brie mentioned in her presentation about the duplication of reporting uh, operations statistics? Yes. Uh, the environmental farm plan, in the end, you end up developing an action plan, which is basically any risks that might exist on your farm. You have a plan and the producer can implement that into the future if they choose. Uh, the other documentation would just be um, delivered at the end of the EFP, and it would outline whatever questions are required, either by your SAI, FSA report, or, say, an AWS report. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is also for you. <laughs> uh, in your experience in working with producers across the province, do you think this approach will have the potential to offer value and benefits to producers in all crop sector value chains? Is this approach more suited to some types of crops than others? Absolutely. I think uh, the EFP has benefits to all producers across Alberta. Again, it's a, a whole farm assessment. Um, but there are producers because it allows, uh, there are uh, benefits because it allows producers to demonstrate their environmental stewardship. 
Um, it allows them to understand and identify their uh, and reduce their environmental risks. It's useful in a, as a planning uh, tool into the future. It provides the, that sustainable sourcing market access to some buyers. Uh, it re can reduce costs and increase efficiency, as well as in some cases, it does allow for access to funding. I think the biggest thing about the Alberta Environmental Farm Plan that would be uh, beneficial to all producers is that's adaptable and flexible. And um, in 2015, we went from a three-inch binder to an online program. Uh, it's quite easy to use, although we did keep the paper uh, version around. Uh, the last one that was done was in 2019. And, uh, and so the option to do it on paper still exists, but right now it's online and there's support uh, provided from technicians across the province. And then, um, as mentioned, it's specifically design, designed for Alberta farmers and can be adopted to or adapted to uh, any operation. So um, you get to select the chapters that are applicable on your farm, and um, grain farmers, dairy farmers, horticulture producers, and irrigation uh, sector are all covered within within the plan. Um, and if you look at something like the rotation list that was in the last presentation of potatoes, wheat, uh, sugar beets, and then barley, um, the EFP would cover all of those. And if that producer were doing that, potatoes requires an EFP because McC McCain's requires an EFP. And then the sugar beet growers are looking at going for um, gold under the international standard of the SAI FSA so that in doing the EFP, they would get both their EFP certificate for their potatoes as well as their, cert uh, their certification for their um, uh, SAI FSA criteria. That sounds great. Very helpful. Yes. We have, we have a couple more questions before we open the floor. Um, John, do you see or hear interest in collective sustainability reporting in other organizations in the agricultural industry? If so, what are some of your general observations with respect to sustainability and stewardship that is being done in more than one area of the industry? The, the whole uh, topic of, of sustainability reporting, it, it's, it's it's getting more complicated. Uh, it, it really is, and, and I think you know the challenge for us, um, first of all, is to is to not just think about how we're going to respond to all of these questions coming at us, but how can we be a little bit proactive and, and put together a sustainability story at the grassroots level, which is what we're trying to do in, in potatoes, so that we can tell a story in in a, in a way that that's meaningful and. Uh, you know, it, it's, I listen to, you know, you think about the Alberta EFP, and you think about, you know, in, in the potato world, we've got our own sustainability tool. Other companies are coming out with their own programs. It gets getting a little bit crazy. In, in Canada, you know, the, uh, the Federation of Agriculture has their own program now. It's called the Canadian Agri-Food Sustainability Initiative. They're trying to come up with an index to measure the sustainability of all Canadian agriculture, um, which in some sense makes a lot of sense, but there are so many of these different initiatives working in parallel, uh, somehow it would be neat if we could figure out how to work together because what we don't want to do is to make lives of farmers more miserable than we already are um, because we, the demands for more information is going up and, and then auditing and things like that, it's, uh, it's, it's getting complicated. So the more we can, can consolidate, the more that we can work together, the more that we can recognize other initiatives without doing our own, the better off we're going to be. It's a challenge. Thank you. And Bree, uh, what were some of the barriers identified that made it challenging for producers to participate in this water stewardship process? Um, so largely they were to do with uh, the fact that the work is already being done, but the need for the documentation itself isn't, isn't exactly there. So the specific requirement for water stewardship plan is not being requested by any of the buyers or entities. The amount of effort and time involved to do a water stewardship plan wasn't therefore going to be an economically re reasonable decision for the farm operation. So the involvement and lots of input and advice was 
enormously valuable for the project, and the plan itself was not going to be valuable for the producer from their perspective. So that was a key a barrier for the specific water stewardship plan document. That being said, we we're seeing the need to walk a line where when the water stewardship is already being done, especially lots of water management practices already being done on the, on the farm, we'll need to be able to recognize that. There are as many requests and interest in being able to acknowledge and document and give credit for that, but it requires the documentation. So we're, we're seeing both sort of sides of this and trying to find what will be the appropriate way to compensate a producer for the time required to do the documentation. Great, thank you. We have about 10 minutes for questions from the floor, so please come up to the microphones and um, ask away. Thank you for a lot of, a lot of information. And John, I'm, I'm gonna pick on you, and you knew I would. Uh, <laughs> I got to serve with John on sustainability board, so I, I, I know all this stuff that you're talking about. The questions that producers are often so frustrated with, 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 with all the things that are demanded of us, and so, uh, and as John said, we're trying to get together as organizations, do one, fill in one plan, and et cetera, et cetera. Often, we do wonder, who actually wants this information? Does the consumer actually really want this, or is it used as a advertising tool to make people, you know, the organizations look better for their shareholders? I, I, I sometimes wonder if, if, if the average consumer actually knew the cost to them, because we pass it on to them, of what we're doing, if they, if they really would want that. So uh, my question to you is, does it, is this for the consumer or is it more for the marketing uh, strategy? Yeah, it's a fair, uh, fair bomb, Mike. You warned me you were going to stick it to me. And, uh, and I'm not going to embarrass you, but what I want to say is that uh, you know, Mike was, uh, was a key participant on our Canada-U.S. Potato Sustainability Initiative, and now it's called the Potato Sustainability Alliance. And uh, Mike was, was one of those farmers that, that always showed up and always participated and always respected that. So I just want to publicly say thanks, Mike. That, that was your, your participation was, was recognized. You know, it's, it's my opinion only. It's, it's not based on fact, but I'm, I'm not convinced that, that consumers really want this information. I, I don't think they're driving it as much as some people tell us that they, they want all this information. I think that particularly in a time like this during hyperinflation when people are going to buy their food, they're probably more interested in the price than they are about the sustainability factors behind it. I can tell you in our world, it's, it's not that, that we... Uh, enjoy gathering all this information and, from farmers, and it's not that we enjoy forcing farmers to provide this, it's because our customers are telling us they want to know this. Uh, now, why are they asking that? Um, I think that it's for different reasons. I know that uh, some of our customers that are publicly traded have uh, had shareholders simply say, we want you to show us how you're sustainably sourcing your products. So you know, they turned to us, and that was kind of the beginning of the PSA, right? Uh, I know that um, for for companies that uh, have to you know to go for for credit, their creditors are forcing them to, to you know to define their sustainability situation and what they're doing, their operations and what they're sourcing. Um, and there's there's no question that uh, sort of sustainability reporting is a marketing tool, and and uh, some companies are are using uh, their sustainability stories as as a way to differentiate themselves. Um, like in our world, we, we talk, often talk about greenwashing, which, which is just an example of companies maybe telling a story that that's less real than, than, than what's going on in, in actual uh, operations. But I can also tell you that that's evolving too, and, and that uh, even in our company, privately held, you know, we're, we're moving to, to do something called ESG reporting, which stands for Environment, Social, and Governance, and it's all driven by data. So the days of just telling stories are kind of gone, and, and we're moving towards more data-driven uh, verification of sustainability stuff. But Mike, I, I don't think it's the consumers. I think it's, it's a myriad of people, it's certainly our customers, uh, it's certainly creditors. Uh, and, and I would also say that even government you know, is, is trying to think about, well, how can, if we're going to help agriculture, we want to know that it's on a certain track. So it's, it's a great question and a complicated one, but I'm back to it. I'm not convinced it's, it's a consumer. Did that kind of answer your question, Mike? Or?
Hi. Uh, I have two questions. Um, Bree, you mentioned that the lack of recognition for uh, best management practices um, is a source of frustration. Did you collect any information on what that recognition might look like? And my other question was around the environmental farm plan. I don't think this is, it's not a new tool. I remember doing one in college many years ago. At that time, I think it was initiated by the Natural Resources Conservation Board. Um, maybe I'm mistaken. Was there, was there financial assistance available at one time for uh, farmers to implement these plans? And I guess I'm wondering what sort of financial assistance might be available today. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Um, honestly, we, don't, we didn't get into the details of what that recognition should look like. It felt to me when I was hearing producer perspectives that this the sense of not having the recognition was kind of coming from a lot of ways and maybe maybe even more so because because of the inundation of questions and like is are you doing this practice or you should do this as a better practice or uh, academia saying this is a better practice so just i think it's the flip side of hearing a lot of you should do things differently and therefore my sense was the recognition or celebration wasn't being heard to balance that maybe. Thanks for that question. Um, I don't think there's ever been an environmental farm plan that's been driven by NRCB so um, I think uh, we've been in place since 2003. Uh, it was uh, a part nine company for a while. It went to, back to the government in 2019. In 2013, Erica uh, was uh, signed on as the, deliverer, the delivery agent of the environmental farm plan. So um, uh, it, there is um, financial support once you complete an EFP and those are particular programs that are usually run through our funding programs and grants through the Alberta government um, and uh, previously it was for things like uh, petroleum tanks that no longer exists however I, my understanding is there will be funding um, based on environmental farm plan completion certificates in the upcoming um, sustainable Canadian agricultural partnership that's coming in April. Um, there are no longer any programs right now that are taking uh, uh, applications in, in right now until they get that new grant completed. Did I answer, did I answer all your questions? Okay, thank you. Anybody else? How about we just finish with one last uh, one last question? We'll open it up. Did somebody else have a question? Mark, did you want to jump in on responding to Nicole's question? I'm sorry, I stepped out. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll just open it up to any or all of you. Um, what is the biggest learning your organization is taking away from this project or process? Any one of you. Okay. Um, John set it up by exactly answering Mike's question. So one of the biggest things I took away was that this idea of a sta sustainability is not just this ideal to the to the provider. It's it it looks like at the processing level, arguably the well potentially the consumer level that they're demanding it and this is not going away. This is becoming table stakes for them to be able to continue to secure contracts to a processor and for a processor to continue to be able to provide their product to, it may not be the consumer, it might be being painted that the consumer wants it, but basically um, to the distribution chains, to the grocery levels, they're saying we're only gonna carry your product if you can demonstrate that you're sustainable, whatever it, that's gonna look like. I think that wave is coming and it's not going away. And, and John 
they, obviously I'm glad to hear Cavendish's do it, but I've seen it everywhere that ESG is, it re, and it's not just that you should, you know, it's the right thing to do. It's going to become reporting every publicly traded organization, their boards are saying this is a component of what we're going to show that we're doing. And so I thought that as a, the supplier, we've got a role to help the producer be part of that solution because the pressure will come to the producer to demonstrate what they're doing. That's great. Well, thank you all for your efforts. Bree, did you have some word? I was just going to say that um, Nutrien was a big supplier. So supporter for the project for multiple phases. Mike Nemeth is here and Nutrien is working from the information from this project and a few others to sort of move forward with trying to solve some of this challenge. WaterSmart is also keen to continue working with, um, with Arika and Tanya to also try and work at what are the ways we can move forward from what is clearly a really naughty, challenging thing that needs to be worked on. That's great. Thank you all for your participation in this pilot project, and um, we really appreciate you coming and talking to us today. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.